crack the whip. Well, welcome to the night's program, folks. We're going to have some fun. And uh, with us tonight, of course, is Dan Naylor, the, the director and owner of the Institute of Real Estate Education, which I believe, in my humble opinion, is the best real estate school in the state of Utah. And I'm proud to be affiliated with them. Well, hello, hello there. Welcome. Hi. And yeah, Kaylee, welcome. Hello. So, um, uh, we're going to start off to Dan is the producer tonight and, and going to help moderate and Dan's going to start off tonight with a few questions. So let's get started, Dan. Sure. So uh, we just wanted to ask a few, uh, a few things about uh, what it's like getting started on your end. I wanted to ask you some of the things that you're thinking about as you're starting your career. So for example, uh, when you think about starting your real estate career, can you tell me some of the things that uh, that you think will be hard as you start your career? Come on, guys, this is your chance to participate. Building, getting clients. I getting think. clients? Yes. Okay. What do you think will be hard about getting clients? Uh, there's a lot of competition. I think probably becoming a new real estate agent would be hard to get your name out there. Yeah. Uh, having people trusting you over somebody who's been doing it for years. Okay, yeah. About um, uh, managing all of the uh, documentation throughout the process. Yeah, trying to make you get all the contracts done and make sure you get every step completed. Okay, good. Any other things you think might be hard as you get started? I've been a little bit concerned about the finances. Um, if you're running your own business, you kind of have to do that. Yeah, yep, that's true. If you've never run your own business before, it is kind of a new, a new experience. It's a whole new wheelhouse of skills you pick up. Okay, yeah, the financing. Okay, anything else you think might be a little hard? Okay, how about this one? Uh, what do you think would be the secret to getting started? I know you're here to see what, what we'll tell you the secret is, <laughs> but I wanted to hear from your perspective getting started. What, it, was it, what is it that you think would be the kind of the secret sauce? How do you think would be your, your magic road to success? I think getting in with Good broker. Great broker, okay, yeah. I know some of those, maybe we can hook you up. <laughs> what else do you think might be a, a good uh, a good secret that would kind of help you get started right away? Finding a good mentor. Reagan? Should I get him in the car? Yeah. Should I bring my mask? Marketing yourself. Marketing yourself, yeah. Social media. Consistency and perseverance. Consistency and perseverance. I like that. It's a good one, Larry. Okay, and then I guess lastly, I just wanted to ask, what do you hope to accomplish? Getting a real estate license. Getting a real estate license, yes. <laughs> what do you hope to accomplish with your real estate license? <laughs> uh, a lot of knowledge. Yeah. And confidence in what I'm doing. Meeting people's needs. Yeah. Yeah, help people and make money, just like Rick says. Yeah, bless <laughs> lives, make money. Spoiler, guys, that'll come later. <laughs> okay. This our... That's great. Uh, okay, that's, that's, yeah, that's helpful. I'm going to, we're going to dial in on some of those things. But for now, I'd like to turn the time back to Rick and let's go ahead and get on to today's topic.
Okay, thank you very much, Dan. Now, folks, uh, getting started and being a new agent and the fears you have and the concerns you have are all very appropriate. After you get that license, it's the next biggest fear. You know, how do I get going? Well, I would, I'd recommend you go to my YouTube channel, Rick Roller Real Estate. Go to YouTube and search Rick Roller Real Estate. And I've got a video on there on how to choose your first broker. You only have one chance. <laughs> choose your first broker. And uh, you might want to watch that. And then I've got some other stuff on getting started in real estate. I've actually done a lot of studying on what it takes to make it. And uh, was rookie of the year when I started back in the ancient times when we use horse and buggies and have developed eight other rookie of the years and hundreds of other agents that have won a lot of sales awards. So, you know, you can check out that stuff. It's all free. Okay, guys, let's get into some questions tonight. All righty, we're... We've got some exciting stuff to talk about because it's stuff you're going to see and you're going to need to know shortly when you're sitting in front of another computer screen. It's much less forgiving than what the one you're sitting in front of right now. And that is the test program. OK, so let's get started. Damp, our very first question, which is. How long must a broker keep records? of real estate transactions. And we've got A is five years, B is three years from the date of the transaction closes, C is another three years from the date the transaction closes, plus the rest of the year that the transaction took place in. And D is five years from the date the transaction closes, plus the rest of the year. And the correct answer is C. As you know, it's three full calendar years following the year of the transaction. Well, hey, we're in December now. So you have December closings and the first of the year starts January 1st. So it'll be three years from January 1st. So you've got uh, 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 21, 22, 23 and the rest of 2020. So uh, transactions are closed in the last part of the year. You may only keep those like 37 months or so, 38, 39. But, but, uh, but those closings you have in January, you're almost keeping those four years because you have to keep it for the entire year in which that transaction closed, whatever portion of the year that is, plus three full calendar years. That's, that's one, two, three full calendar years following the year of transaction, okay? That, that's something you must know, folks. There you go. And that'll be on the state exam, of course. Next question, please, questions? Okay. Now, oh, I guess one question that might come up in your mind is, well, the broker has to keep the records, but should I keep my own? And, they, and the, the answer is absolutely. You must keep your own records because you don't know what's going to happen to your broker. I mean, his records might get burned up or I don't know. They might go out of business and move out of state and it's difficult to get a hold of them. Uh, when you leave that brokerage, which you probably will, most people don't stay at the same brokerage their whole career. They move around a little bit always chasing the the elusive uh grass is greener uh and some and most of the time it is you know i mean sometimes you you need to do that but but a lot of times you don't i know a few agents that have stayed with one company for 20 30 years and that's their career but but they're very few um I a question so, about that. what's that a andrea thank you how do you suggest we discover a filing system that works for us because i imagine we need electronic and paper and if I set that system up ahead of time, I feel like I'll have a lot less nerves about it. You could, yeah, what I would do is just, you know, keep, keep it electronically. You know, you can put it in Google Docs or a program that's made to keep uh, PDF files. And then if you feel uncomfortable with that, just burn a CD every six months or so. Okay. You know, or, uh, and then, uh, and this, you know, just keep them, you know, or you can put them in a cloud. Okay. But, you're, but the reason you want to keep your own records is not only because it might be difficult to get a hold of your broker, but someday you're going to want to get a broker's license and you're going to have to get enough points to do that and you're going to have to prove it. And a lot of brokers are, you know, some brokers will be very helpful with that and some brokers won't. You know, some brokers are going to be like the dad in, in, in my fat Greek wedding when Tula wants to go get married. Are you going to leave me? <laughs> and it's very dramatic. It's like a divorce or something. And, you know, I, 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 other brokers say, look, you know, I knew you'd be here and I, for a while and I appreciate the opportunity to work with you. And if you feel like you want to need to move on, that's great. You know, but, you know, hopefully they're a little bit more mature about the whole thing. I mean, I, I, 
all my new agents, when I, when I was running a company, I always told them, look, I expect you to be here but uh, for a while, but you know, this is a broker training school. If you're here after three years, I'm gonna say, why? <laughs> I mean, come on, you should get your own broker's license, do your own thing. Uh, okay, sorry. next question, please. Sorry, one more thing. So keep a master spreadsheet of all of our transactions too. Is that the best way to prove it with our broker? Well, you need to keep copies of the documents. You know, you need to keep all your disclosure documents. I keep, I keep, I keep all the contracts, everything that anybody had to sign. I keep my checklist. I keep, you know, and things that people sign are uh, like the buyer due diligence agreement. And, you know, there's a whole list of contracts that someone's going to sign. Anything that anybody signed, I want to keep. Okay. And it, I also, I also, I also print out, I, I do emails so that I can have uh, I can print out uh, all the emails for that transactions and put that in a separate, uh, in other, it's a communication file. Okay, so, but I keep a transaction log. I mean, you know, I used to keep mine just a, a spiral bounder. In, in fact, I still have mine from the early days. I don't, it's over here somewhere. But anyway, the point is, it's good to have that transaction log so you can kind of see and in, in it, I just had the address, price sold for when it sold, whether the, it was a listing or sell side, and where the lead came from, because I wanted to keep track of, of my marketing to see what was actually working. It's just like running a business. You need to know where your, your clients are coming from, and it come from various sources and whatnot. But, sure. but, um, and then, uh, and then you, you put all that digitally and keep it digitally. I don't want to, you know, I mean, I, I don't keep physical records. It's, you know, but, you know, after 40 some years, it, it eat up a whole room in my house. You know, I mean, it's been thousands of transactions. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay. Good question. Next question, please, Dan. If the brokerage closes, they mu what, what must they do to comply with division requirements to keep records for, for up to the three years? Well, A is the correct answer. They must notify the division where the records will be kept. One of the brokers I work for, um, you know, I was a top listing and top selling agent in that company for as long as they were in existence, but there were all like 17 of us there. It was a smaller company, but she, uh, she decided that she wanted to move to Oregon. <laughs> so she closed her business and moved to Oregon, but she had to let, of course, I had copies of everything I'd done, which I didn't need by that time. I was already associate broker anyway, but you need to keep your own records. Um, you know, you don't depend on the broker to do that. I mean, if a lawsuit comes up or somebody had a question, uh, you know, it's just important. And, uh, but, but, you know, but a few years ago, anything was over 20 years old, I pretty much threw all that stuff away. So, I mean, it's getting to be ancient history. But I would, I would say anything that's within the IRS audit range, which is about seven or eight years, I would certainly keep those. Do you have an opinion on that, Dan? How long do you keep your records? Um, I keep them until my file drawer fills up. <laughs> <laughs> when I've got to make room, then I throw them in a box and put them somewhere else. Um, uh, I, you know, eight years as I think about as far back as you would need to go after yeah. that, no one's going to be asking about that anymore. So yeah. in fact, they even shortened some of the statute of limitations this year on, on stuff like advertising and stuff. So, yeah. so I think the three year is of course the minimum plus the year and then yeah, if you keep them up to eight years, that's plenty. Okay, very good. Next question, please. What is a principal broker required to keep in the transaction files? Referrals from the client, signed agency disclosures, thank you cards, a list of agents in the community. Uh, your agency disclosures, guy, ob uh, folks, obviously, that's the one that the buyer and sellers have signed and, and state. So it's, the answer is B. Um, you know, and that this is, this is a real serious issue. You've got to understand agency. I re just this week, just this week, I had a young man that that got his license. He's actually dating one of my daughters, and you know, I he's with a big company here in town. I mean, it's a great company. I I think the world of them and whatnot. But his very first transaction out of the out of the uh, box, you know, he put together was a house that his grandfather owned. His grandfather died. So the heirs to the estate, which would include his parents, uh, decided to you know, clean it up a little bit, put it on the market, was on holiday, went under contract quickly. He found his own buyer for it. You know? And I said, oh, that's interesting. And how did you structure the transaction? And he says, well, I, I uh, did limited agency. 
Does anyone see a problem with that? Guys, I said, well, that was your first mistake. And he said, well, I talked over with my broker. I disclosed that, you know, I was related to the sellers. So, okay, that's great that you disclose you're related to the sellers. But does that remove the conflict of interest? I mean, I, I mean, come on. If you're doing limited agency, you're supposed to be representing both par parties and be neutral on certain issues. But you can't represent someone when your dad was an heir to <laughs> one of the owners of the property. You can't do that. You know, and I, I said, you know, whatever. I mean, call your broker and have them clean it up, but or not. But you know, I mean, I'd hate to see you clipped on your very first deal. That's too bad. He says, well, I went to the new agent class. I said, yeah, but it wasn't mine. Oh no, our company has one we like to put on. Well, you know. You've been to mine, you don't know damn well, you can never ever represent a buyer when you're related to the seller. I mean, come on. Or you can't represent the seller when you're related to the buyer. You get that in front of a guy in a black robe or a lady in a black robe. What do you think they're gonna say about that? You mean you're telling me you're representing both these people equally and fairly and the seller was your grandmother? <laughs> I mean, come on. Rick, what's the solution to that? Like, what are There's your- There's tons of solutions to that tons of solutions okay um uh, i mean he found his own buyer okay the, the the what i would suggest you do is to find somebody else who would take over representing the buyer and then of course what pops in your head well then that's going to take money out of my pocket yeah but not that much commissions are negotiable guys you call someone in the office and say look i need someone to represent a buyer because it's my it's my dad who inherited the property from my grandparents you know, would you do it for 1500 bucks? You know, I'm not going to pay them 3% of a, what, a half a million dollar sale, <laughs> you know, but for 1500 bucks, you think you'd find someone in the office who would just, you know, write up the contract and attend to closing and answer some questions and whatnot? Oh, heavens, yes. That's one way I'd do it. Or, you know, you, 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 could, add, you could have them sign an unrepresented buyer's agreement, you know, and tell them, well, look, you know, now that you found the property, what you're mainly concerned about, of course, are the legal aspects. Why don't I get you a lawyer? I have two or three lawyers that I keep. Uh, they're, they don't represent me. They've never represented me, but they're young lawyers. We have two law schools in the state, one in the North, one in the South. They're cranking them out every year. A lot of them go to work for big companies and and whatnot, but a lot of them, you know, get class C or B office space in some basement somewhere, they'll work for five or six hundred dollars. Okay. <laughs> and you pay it. So you say, look, folks, you know, uh, I think, you know, since you've already sound a property and you want to buy this property, I can't represent you because I'm, you know, really tied into the, the seller here one way or another. But uh, uh, why don't I get you a lawyer? I'll, you know, I mean, now that you found a property, what you're mostly concerned about are the legal aspects. Is that right? Yeah. I said, well, I'll, you know, I'll even pay for it. Okay. You don't need another agent. Which would you rather have, another agent or a lawyer? Uh, well, I'll, I'll take the lawyer if it's free. Well, yeah, you're good. Okay. So now I'm only out five or six hundred dollars. You know. Now these aren't. You know. I mean, these aren't my attorneys. I mean, they can't do that. It'd be a conflict of interest, and you know, I mean, my attorney would charge a lot more, but that's okay. They'll work for five, six hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. They got to read the deeds, make sure the documents are signed correctly, uh, uh, explain to them the legal aspects of the loan they're signing, and uh, you know things like that. So they feel comfortable or someone there on their side, but they're unrepresented by an agent, or mm -hmm. they might feel like you know this is their fifth or sixth transaction. I don't even care, you know. Thank uh, you, you know. For that. Hey, I've owned sixteen houses. I don't need no stinking agent, and I don't need no stinking lawyer. You know, fine. You you be, you could be unrepresented. Okay. But there's tons of ways to handle that. The important thing to know is that if you have a direct relationship to a buyer or a seller, for example, you work for Ivory Homes. Every home you sell is an Ivory Home. They don't allow you to sell other things. Every dime you make in real estate come from Ivory Homes. Do you think you could represent a buyer? Ever? Go like this. Oh, heavens no. Ivory is your employer. There's no way that you could represent a buyer. And, and Ivory, uh, captive agents never represent a buyer. You know, so anything less than that, you know, has different degrees. But I would say if, if you even do a lot of multiple transactions with a buyer or a seller, you have a buyer that likes to buy a lot of things, 
And so, you know, you're doing 12 transactions a year with them. I would never represent a seller if I'm that tied to a buyer. Would, would you? You want to get that in front of a judge? You know, come on. Think, think about the downside of some of this stuff. So I don't know. I might call him this week, see how it panned out. But I, I'm sure he had some very restless nights. I don't want you to have restless nights. So the moral of that story is come to my 12-hour class, damn it. Learn the right way to get started. Okay, next one. And, and you know what? For any of you, it's free. Just mention you went to dance school. It's free. I'm not going to charge you a dime. And I'll even give you a lot of cool stuff. Thank you. Yeah. But hurry up. I'm not going to do it forever. All right. All right. The principal broker required to keep in transaction files signed agency disclosures. That was B. If the closing takes place at a title company, who's, who's responsible to ensure the settlement statement is accurate? It is the principal broker always. We are responsible as a principal broker for the accuracy of all the settlement statements, even though you didn't prepare them. You know, the real fallacy of this is that most principal brokers never see the settlement statements till after it closes. <laughs> you know, it's it's kind of hard to unravel a problem when, you know, you got to, but, you know, it's hard to unravel a problem. You know, um, it, it, the deals I've been directly involved with as an agent, you know, I've always get the settlement sheets in advance and go over them. Sometimes it's hard, but find, a, find an escrow agent who will work with you. Someone will spend some time with you. I know a lot of closings occur at the end of the month and you know they're really busy, but if they don't have time to take a half hour with you or 20 minutes before closing, get there early or maybe the day before. You know, the, One of the problems is we're always pushing the envelope and it's not the escrow agent's fault, it's the bank's fault because you know, they're, they're always getting the documents in at the very last minute. But try to get the documents and go over them and don't, you know, learn. You, you want to be a pro in our business, you need to learn the, the business, okay? You need, you need to understand these numbers. You need to understand what a debit and a credit is. You know, you need to go to some, you know, I've got a, I've, uh, Dan has an excellent class online uh, called the Agent's Guide to Settlement Statements. You can take it, you know, uh, on his, it's a two hour class, but it goes through in detail. It's one that I and a title agent teach, uh, but that's, that's a good class to take. I mean, guys, don't just take 18 hours of CE credit, go to tons of classes, learn about the business, become a pro. Next question, please. All right, S signed a, S signed a listing agreement to sell their home with their real estate agent. Um, and the next day they're a broker who is a sole proprietor dies, you know, brokers, you know, they're, they die. And, and, and that's a good question to ask your broker. Are you an entity or a sole proprietor? If, if most brokers are entities, you know, they're an LLC or, or they're, lim they're a limited liability company or they're a, a corporation and, and those entities don't die. So if a broker dies and the company is actually an LLC, the division will allow a reasonable period of time for the company to put a new broker in place and you don't lose your listing. But in this case, the question says he's a sole proprietor. If you're a sole proprietor and you die, well, you're, you're dead. And so you're, what happens is uh, what must S, that's the seller do to continue working with the agent. Well, they've got to say, sign an affidavit that the listing's still valid. No, eh, not that one. Apply for an extension, eh, not that one. See nothing. They can continue with agreement with the agent, and eh, not that one, because the broker was a sole proprietor. They weren't an entity. That's a good question to ask your broker. Are you an entity or sole proprietor? Because if you have 12 listings and, and the broker dies and they're a sole proprietor, you've got to go back to all 12 of those sellers and get them to sign up with your new broker. <laughs> First, you got to get a new broker and then you got to sign them up. So again, and you're not going to get them all. You know, they're going to find out during the time you had the listing that their favorite niece just got her license. They didn't know about it. Oh, my uncle Bob, you should have listened with me, you know, and then he has an opportunity to correct that problem and you're going to, so, you know, uh, ask them if they're an entity, it might be important to you. That's the answer is D. Next question, please. Compared to a sales agent, associate broker has more authority, has less authority has the same authority, <laughs> has no authority. You have the same authority as if you're a salesperson. You know, it gives you more panache. You say, well, I'm a broker, you know, and you can walk a little taller or whatever, but 
and it gives you a little bit of more opportunity to do other things. Like, you know, you could run a branch office or you could, you know, leave your broker and start your own company if you wanted to. Um, but you have the same authority, really a, a license status as if you're a sales agent. I think you ought to become a broker. It's just a natural progression in the business. You learn more, you get to do more and, and other things might open up to you that you didn't realize. Um, but, um, but some agents never do. In fact, most agents don't. They, Dan, how many brokers is it we have? It's only like, like 2,800 or something, isn't it? Or 3,800? Yeah, something like that. Like about 2,800 out of like 16,000 agents or more. Yeah, about 18,000 now, I think. But it's, yeah, it's it, gone up. Yeah, yeah, somewhere in there. So, you know, it's not, it's not that many. You know, I mean, be one. Be proud. You know, I mean, do that. <laughs> Okay, if an agent broker in your, uh, if an agent's broker has their broker's license suspended, uh, what must the agent do to continue practicing real estate? And the answer to this one is D, they must activate their license with a real broker, someone that's active. If their broker's license is suspended, all your agents are suspended is, I mean, they're all made inactive. You know, you don't have 30 days, you, you, you know, you, you must get your they must get their broker. No, and, you know, you can't do that that quickly. And they must never practice real estate again. Well, that'd be pretty severe. It wasn't you that got suspended. It was the broker. That's why even if a broker is suspended just for like over a weekend, it's tragic. I mean, because the, all your listings are canceled. Okay. You can't advertise. All those signs have to come down. Uh, and all your agents are going to quit and go somewhere else. <laughs> it's it's going to be a mess, you know. So you know, might have a few that stick with you, but you got to go back and get everything relisted with the people. It's going to be a real tragedy, you know. So it's just about put you out of business, is what it is. Okay, questions on that one. You don't go to brokers that get suspended. <laughs> I mean, that's anyway. A client, a client wants to collect interest on the money. Oh, by the way, if you are thinking about going with the broker and you want to check out their record, you could, you could, you could Google to see if they've had any uh, uh, disciplinary actions by the Division of Real Estate, and it'll pop right up because it's all in a public record. And sometimes brokers have agents that screw up, but when the broker uh, gives bad advice, like the broker that gave the bad advice for this young agent I was referring to earlier and said, oh yeah, as long as you gave them a notice of interest, you'll be fine. And I said, <laughs> I said okay, great. And it wasn't covered in 12 hour class. Yeah, some people teach the 12 hour class and like it's a, a rehash of pre-licensing school. You already went through that once. You need to take a 12 hour class that takes you through the do's and don'ts and how to keep your self out of trouble and how to make some money or bless lives and then make some money. Okay, this one, uh, a client wants to collect interest on the money that they give the broker as earnest money for a transaction. What must they do? They got to get everyone's permission. Um, you know, because uh, trust accounts generally are not interest bearing accounts. And uh, however, there is a provision in the Utah rules and regs uh, and in the code, in the law, that allows, if everyone gave permission for the money to be put in a special trust account that draws interest, but the interest then has to be given to a uh, nonprofit home type charity, um, or they could agree that, the, you know, I mean, we're talking, if large earnest monies, uh, gosh, I just did one, it was $100,000, um, you know, they're not going to, and it's a commercial deal. It's not going to close till next year sometime, maybe in February. So, you know, they're not, you know, they don't want to leave that money vacant. I mean, but you could collect interest if ever, everyone agreed to it and, and especially who the interest is going to, or the broker could have another trust account that if he puts money in that the buyers and sellers agree to that they, uh, they goes to a charity. That's not as popular as it once was. In fact, most brokers don't even like to hold earnest money anymore. They make you give it to a title company, most, a lot of them, uh, which is another thing they could do. Okay, next question, please. Uh, principal brokers license in several states. They maintain a single trust account in their home state of California. Deposit all the earnest money for transactions to that same trust account for transactions in Col or, uh, California, Utah, and Nevada. This practice is improper because... Our codes in Utah, our laws and our rules say that it's C, Utah requires that earnest money must be kept in a Utah-based trust account. You know, it could be a title, it could be a, uh, 
credit union or it could be a, a, a bank, but it has to be kept in a Utah trust account, okay? These are, these are excellent things you need to remember for the future, folks. Okay, Utah broker must have a trust account established in Utah. Okay, D, whether or not the broker resides in Utah or has an office in Utah. You could, you could be a, uh, a non-resident broker. I have, a, I have a broker's license in Colorado and in uh, you know, Idaho. Um, I recently took the test in Idaho, but I don't know if I'm in a license in Idaho or not. But anyway, they, but they, uh, um, but I have a, an, and in Colorado is different. They let me have my trust account in, in here in Utah, which is kind of weird, but, um, but anyway, uh, so you don't have to reside in Utah to have Utah broker's license, but our rules in Utah say that you must have the earnest money kept in a Utah trust account, whether you reside here or not. We want the money kept in Utah where it's going to do our state more good. Maybe. And it's easier for people to get out if they sue and, and then have to get it out of a bank account somewhere and, and they win. Okay, the next one, B is a builder and they take a deposit from R, the uh, buyer, to, to, to build a house. If B wants to use that money from the deposit to uh, purchase construction materials and pay for work, uh, what would they need? In other words, when you buy a new home that's being built by a contractor, you're not going to sign the normal uh, real estate purchase contract that we use for existing homes. You're going to sign a different agreement. It's either going to be our state approved real estate purchase contract for new construction, or it's going to be a broker's personal contract that he had his lawyer put together. Well, I guess which one most builders have. They have one that's put together by their, by their lawyer, which only makes sense. I mean, they want to protect themselves. And so in that agreement, normally there's a time in there where they can start taking that money out of their their trust account, or it will be delivered from your trust account if you're the broker holding it, and put to, to work on the house. Particularly if you order special customization features like you know black toilets or pink toilets or something like that. They know that if you get out of the deal, um, uh, they're going to have to replace all that stuff <laughs> to get another buyer to buy the house. And so uh, they might want to use some of that earnest money, and, and they can you know, as long as everyone agrees to it. The answer is C, written permission from the, from the buyer, okay? Okay, uh, next question. Jay is buying a house. They want to give a promissory note as earnest money. Who would they make the, the who would be the payee on the promissory note? Who are they making the promissory note out to? Well, in our state, uh, we say that it should be made out to the seller. I mean, the seller's the ones agreeing to take the note. Um, you know, the offer comes in and you show that you immediately tell the seller that, uh, that, you know, they must understand that, you know, it's $5,000 earnest money, but it's in the form of a promissory note. Okay. And so um, the seller agreed to do it. So you make the note out to the uh, seller and you keep it in your file. If the transaction fails, you deliver the note to the seller so the seller can try to pr uh, pursue it and get, and get the money. Okay, the next question, in order to distribute earnest money, a broker must have written permission from the buyer, oral permission from the seller, written permission from both, both the buyer and the seller, and a broker can distribute earnest money at their own discretion. Um, okay, you can't distribute the earnest money at your own discretion if you're the broker. You hear something like that in real estate school, but it's not phrased exactly this way. A broker can call a deal but, there, but he has to be given permission to call the deal. And so in the Rep C contract, the buyer and the seller signed a contract uh, giving the broker permission to call the deal. So really the answer then is C, written permission from both the buyer and seller to do so. Uh, most brokers, if, if they are uh, not giving the money back to the buyer, or even if they are, they want the seller to sign a release. And if they're giving the money to the uh, back to the seller, they want the buyer to sign a release. Uh, but, but if they won't, you know, the buyer or the seller, either one that's saying, well, I don't want to give up the earnest money. Well, you know, they already gave you permission that as long as there was a, uh, the contract was followed to the letter, meaning that they had the right to cancel it within a certain deadline and they canceled within the deadline, the broker could 
give the money. But that still, he still had written permission from the buyer and seller. Kind of a tricky one, but that's why I spent a couple of minutes on it. But any questions on that? Okay. If P is an owner of a brokerage, he opened a new branch in a neighboring city and hired T to be the branch manager. P, who's the, the, the principal broker, has to do what? P must also, A, register the branch with the Division of Real Estate. They have to get a branch office license. Okay. The Association of Realtors is not the same thing as the Division of Real Estate. The Division of Real Estate, we're, we're looking at B, answer B now. The Division of Real Estate is our regulatory agency. They're, they're the ones that give us our license. Association of Realtors are our private club. We've got a big clubhouse <laughs> right off of I-15 I there, you know, I mean, it's right off the, about, you know, 100 South. And uh, that's our, that's our kind of clubhouse. And, and the individual uh, associations, you know, we have state associations and we have, uh, this is the association, that's the state association. And we have a national association offices in Chicago. And then the individual uh, areas like uh, uh, Utah County and uh, Wasatch County and Park City, they all have little offices as well. Uh, but that's our club. That have nothing to do with your license, you know. I mean, he he opened a branch office in a different city. It might even be in a different board of realtors too. Open a separate property management trust account. That's not what the question is all about. And close any existing trust account. And that that's not right. A brokerage sets up a temporary branch office and a model home. Now, the, the thing here is it's temporary, okay? They do not need to register with the real estate division unless the branch office will be there for more than, and the answer is 12 months. So if it's gonna be like, you know, it's, there's one thing about having an open house, you know, which is a temporary thing. And another thing about having a model home and that could be a temporary thing too, or it could be a long-term thing. But if it's gonna be a branch office, that's a different kind of thing. A branch office needs to be, be monitored and registered with the division. And a branch office is where someone goes to work all the time. You know, They have no office anywhere else and this is where they go. Um, so the difference between a, a model home that's, that's uh, uh, monitored and run by agents that are coming from different branch offices and they, they're following a schedule and whatnot, that's different than a branch office. Now, some brokers will open a branch office within a, a brokerage company um, uh, in a model home, and that's a branch office. But usually it's a little bit remote, but it doesn't have to be. But if they're calling it a branch office and they got to go through the steps and register it with the division and pay extra fees and and it has to be a run either by a branch manager or the principal broker could run up to three offices if, if they want to. Branch, branch manager can run up to three branches if they want to as well. Okay, you must be licensed to represent others in property management. And um, now, you know, your mom might own a house and you take care of it for her, but, and that's okay. But if there's gonna be compensation, this is the key. If you're gonna make money, if she's gonna pay you on a regular basis, A, answer A, then you have to have a license, okay? But you know, if you're just running, you know, and you're not licensed and you're helping your dad you know, manage a building and he's not paying you, you know, that's, that's okay. You don't have to be licensed. And you don't have to be related to him either. It could have been your best buddy that saved your life in Vietnam or, or Afghanistan. <laughs> You're just managing a property for him. He's not paying you. The, the key here is compensation. Okay, if you're paid, you gotta be licensed. Okay, Jay is representing another person to uh, purchase an uh, option to, uh, oh, wait a minute. Going back a second on that managing without a license. Um, and, and we'll see a question on this a little later, but there are situations where you can be paid, but not, but only as a, a normally licensed person. Like, you know, if, if you work for a, a chiropractor, chiropractors and dentists love real estate. I mean, <laughs> if you're a good chiropractor and making dough, or you're a good dentist or an orthodontist, and you're making a lot of dough, they love real estate. You know, that's, that's actually a niche you could target. 
you know, because if you want to work with investors, those are two areas where they're making good money. They have excellent credit and they, and they buy a lot of real estate. You know, they wouldn't mind owning 20, 30 homes, you know? And so, uh, so let's say the, the dentist has a administrative assistant that helps him run his practice and whatnot. He or she could manage all those properties, but they can't be paid a, a percentage or wage. They have to be a regularly salaried employee of, of the owner. Okay. And, um, uh, uh, but eventually it could uh, get into a situation where, you know, one of his uh, other practitioners in the office also wants to buy real estate and wants you to manage his stuff too. If, if that's a different entity, it's going to get really dicey. So if you're getting involved with a situation like that, which, you know, property management is a great thing to do in, in one respect, and it's a pain in the tush in others. Most of the lawsuits and, and problems we have with people are in property management. If you want to avoid a lot of those, it's great. But on the other hand, uh, oh, Dan has a wonderful class on the Agent's Guide to Property Management. You might want to watch that one too. It's online and uh, that would give you some insights into whether you think you really want to get involved in property management. It, the, the, the pluses on it are is you get a great wage. I mean, I know one property management company in town at supplies agents with a car and a cell phone and gives them a wage. I mean, that's, that's a pretty cool way to start the business. And you can sell real estate also on the side. If that appeals to you, you give me a call. I'll, I'll give you the name of the broker, but okay. Um, the last one here on this page that I've got is, is Jay is representing another person to purchase an option to Jay is representing another person to purchase an option to purchase a home. So they're not buying the house, they're buying an option to purchase the house. And you need to have a real estate license. You know, whether you're selling any interest in real estate, you're selling fee simple absolute, or you're, to sell, you're selling a defeasible fee, uh, you're doing leasing with an option to buy, or you're just selling a flat out option to buy a property or a house. Uh, then you need to have a real estate license. It's, it's just too close to what we do in real estate. It is real estate. Right. Okay, well, yes. I just ask you, what's the, talk, talk to me about this purchase and option to purchase a home. Can sure. you talk about that depth there? Well, when the market was really, really hot, okay. Uh, uh, well, well, like it is now. I mean, I mean, it, options work really well if it's a really hot property. In other words, something that's highly desirable. And you go to that owner and you say, look, I'm thinking about buying your property, but I want to know if I can get it rezoned. I want to know if I can do this, I can do that with it. You don't want to buy the real estate, then find out you can't do it for the purpose you want to, you know, to, to own it for, you know, I mean, so, uh, so what has to happen is you might want to buy an option. So, uh, well, let's go back to that, that chiropractor, go back to that dentist. I just did one for a chiropractor just a few weeks ago, uh, closed on a few, well, last, last month, for first part of October. Anyway, what happened was he wanted to buy a house that he could remodel into a, um, a clinic. And, you know, there's a lot of people that want to do that. I mean, insurance agents, a lot of them like to buy little houses on busy streets if, if they could remodel them into an office. Uh, hairstylists, you know, want to buy a house and remodel it into a, a house, you know, a salon, but that property has to be able to go that way. I even know lawyers, <laughs> those, you know, those uh, guys that graduated last in their class and they're, you know, they didn't want to do the basement they, uh, office. They wanted to buy a house and remodel it and put their law practice in there. You know, that's fine. You know, it's a great little niche. So, uh, but they're not going to want to buy it unless they know they can rezone it and they can rezone it for the purpose they want to do. But they don't want to go through all that trouble because it, it, it's a big project and it costs money, you know, to go before the, the county and, and, and get a, a definitive answer on whether you can do what you want to do with it. So it takes time, effort, money. So they purchase an option. Okay. Uh, what if you're trying to do an assemblage and get a big enough piece to put a bigger building on and it's owned by three owners. Well, you don't want to be buying all the two parcels and the guy in the middle it won't sell to you so, you. so you can't do your project. So you option the other two and then make sure you can buy the one in the middle. And when you get them all optioned and ready to go, then you start closing on all these deals. You know, it's, it has kind of a commercial slant to it, uh, maybe, 
but not necessarily. I know a lot of people when the market was really hot. I, I, we used to have vans. Remember that, Dan? We had vans that would show up from California or Vegas, and they had all these buyers in the van. They'd go to these different uh, new home sellers, and they, they would buy every house in the subdivision. You know, they'd put it under contract which was the same thing as taking an option. And then they would factor or sell the contracts. The mark was going to value so fast in 06, 05, 06, in that era that they could sell that contract and make 10 grand, never even close on the property. You know, so by the time the builder got the house, got the lot, got the permit, put the house on it, six months down the road, it was worth 10 grand more than what they originally agreed to sell it to that other guy. He just factored or sold his contract to someone else. So wow. that would be like buying an option and reselling it. That's incredible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, the way prices are going up right now, they've gone up 20% in the last, what, six months or so in, in, in hot areas. Even so, not hot areas. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, we've got a question by chat. Chat. Says if a sales agent's broker died today in a car accident and the brokerage is a sole proprietor, then what happens to the agent's license? They're, they're immediately uh, put inactive. Really? Yeah, yeah. That's why you want to know if your broker is a, is, you know, is this, is Hot Dog Realtors, is it a sole proprietorship, Mr. Broker or Ms. Broker? Okay. Are, are you, is it a sole proprietorship or is it an entity? Is it a non breather? Because non-breathers don't die. Your broker may die, and she may be the sole owner of the brokerage, but the division will allow a reasonable time for a new broker to come put their license to that entity because the entity didn't die. Usually, it's a couple of weeks or so, you know. But they, you know, I know, uh, I know a couple of examples just this year of brokers that have died, and they've had to deal with the brokerage. Um, yeah, who died? One was COVID-related. One was. Uh, one was not COVID related, but uh, um, all the agents under there, one of them, it was her husband who was the broker and he died and she was, uh, I think she was just a sales agent. So she couldn't just step in as the broker. So they had to figure out something to do with all their agents until she could get her license or hire someone on. So it was kind of a mess. Yeah. Well, they have to find another broker. So what, what are they going to do? They're going to go to the list of brokers, licensed brokers in the state of Utah, start going down the list, say, hey, would you be interested in stepping in for a year or six months or so? And they're going to hire you as a hired gun. But you've got to have you've got to have the broker's license in order to do that. So, you know, that's one reason to have a broker. You might get a call out of the blue. You know, I mean, you know, it might be four, five, six, seven, eight grand a month, you know, whatever. And I certainly wouldn't do it for a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars a month. I know there's some brokers that might, but it's too much liability. But if they want you to come in and run the company for a while, uh, you know, it could be a nice little gig for you. You may like it. You know, they they may like you so much they don't even, you know, want to get their dad to come out of retirement or or whatever it would have to happen. But most brokers are entities. You know, just for that reason, it's just more fair to their agents. Okay. Another that, little that, question. That was a question, not from a guy named Chat, but they came in on Chat. Okay. <laughs> There's another uh, one. All righty. Chat. Tell you what, techno dinosaur I am. Okay. Anyway. So another one that says, uh, so you have to be under a broker. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You can't be a, a sales agent on your own, and you don't want to be either. There's, you know, you get a license. And, okay, you went to real estate school. You watched 120 hours of fascinating videos. <laughs> You did a lot of practice exam. You know, you come you come to these Zoom meetings so you can get ready for the test, and uh, you worked real hard. And you got you got you got at least a C minus. That's seventy percent on a multiple choice exam. Woo hee! Okay, and now you have a license. You are one. You still don't know diddly about doing any deals. Okay, you 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 know a lot about the laws. You know what the rules and regulations are to a certain extent. It's, you know, you can remember them, but you, you're still not ready to do deals. You need help, you know? And so in our state, you start as a salesman and then you must be attached by the year umbilical cord to a broker. Okay. That broker could be an entity, non-breather, or it could be an entity. It could just be a broker who's, you know, working under their name or working under a, 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 a doing business as a, a 
you know, a DBA. And then uh, after a period of time and you show uh, that you've done enough transactions, you can once again, come back, take another 120 fascinating hours and pass another test. This time getting a higher percentage, 80%. Can't hey, slip by on that. Do you need to become a broker? And yeah, points too that you have to do. Yeah, but how many years? Three years minimum. Minimum, yeah. Yeah, and then you have to, uh, uh, during that three years, you have to get a certain number of transaction points to prove that you just didn't do one deal a year for three years. You know, you have to have a certain number of points. And you have to know what some of those points are and what you can get them for. You know, so that's something you need to you know, bone up a little bit for the exam. But, uh, and then you get a broker's license. And if you like your company, don't want to leave, just be associate broker, that's okay. And then if you, the opportunity comes along, you can do something else. So Rick, can you also kind of give us a sketch of what would be appropriate to expect from a broker as, it, as in how much support or what that support looks like? What, well, how, how we're getting good support is my question, I guess. Yeah. I, as a new agent, um, I, uh, uh, you know, I, the first conversation I had with my broker, my first broker I got into business um, in Colorado and my, my first interaction with my broker, other than the initial interview, was when I won Rookie of the Year. <laughs> it's my first and only conversation with him. But in his defense, he hired a sales manager. So there has to be someone over you that can look out for you, that you can go to. I wrote my first offer on a home my first week into business. And I wrote it up and I took it back to my sales manager, Oli, and Oli rewrote it. <laughs> so it was better. And then, and then I took it back and had the buyer re-sign it and then took it out and got it accepted. And uh, that was cool. Got my first list of my first sale my first week. Okay. And I can tell you exactly where that came from. And this is, this is something you guys need to do because you're worried about getting started. That came from family. Okay. That first buyer of mine was Steve Matthews. He's my brother-in-law. Bless his heart. He waited till I got in the business to buy a house. And he knew I was brand new because he kept, you licensed yet? You licensed yet? And then we went out and found him a house. And then I said, Steve, you're the only person I know in this town because we both just moved there. And I said, uh, do you know of anyone that wants to buy or sell any real estate? Yeah, there's this guy in my ward that I've been going to. And he, uh, he said he wanted to sell. Well, let's get him on the phone. So we called him right then. And Steve said, look, this is Rick. You know, wow, we just bought a house. I'm so excited. Oh, it's so cool. And, and so he handed me the phone. I said, yeah, my name's Rick. Can I come over and see you tonight? Or would tomorrow be better? Well, come over tonight. Okay, so went over and listed his house. So my first listing, my first sale came from who? Family. Family. Now, some of you are saying, well, I don't want to work with family. Well, you're stupid. You know, your family loves you. <laughs> some of them. Some of them don't like, her, don't like you, you know, but that's okay. You know, your family are the ones that will support you from the beginning. They know you're brand new, but you, you're licensed by the state of Utah. How badly can you screw it up? Okay. And there's someone like your sales manager or broker. It's going to, you know, look over everything very carefully and make sure you did the right thing with the exception of this new agent's broker that, that told them that it was okay to be a limited agent with your, anyway, make sure you work for the right broker too. <laughs> but um, guys, there are six sources of business that are gonna give you 83% of all your business, your first two years in the business, okay? And I've studied this out. I've had brokers from uh, uh, Oregon and uh, Utah and uh, my own personal experience from, and broker friends of mine from Florida. And it runs between 80, I wanna know what they are, the six sources of business that's gonna give you most of your business your first two years. Friends, family, that's two. Referrals, see Steve's listing of referral was my first listing, wasn't it? Yeah. And by the way, when do you ask for a referral? Larry, you, you have an opinion? When, when are you going to ask for a referral? Ashley, what do you think? As soon as you meet them. No, when they're happy. 
<laughs> and people say, oh, I can't ask for a referral. We haven't closed the deal yet. Why are you stupid? They may not be happy when you close the deal. <laughs> you know, some guy, you know, took his barbecue and he wasn't supposed to or something. You know, they're all ticked off with you because they took the barbecue. You know, whatever is worth 50 bucks. You know, I mean, so anytime they're happy, you ask for a referral. I mean, that's just easy. Steve got his house under contract. He was thrilled to death. He was ecstatic. I asked for a referral. He put his buddy on the phone. I went right over and took the listing. Uh, friends and family, referrals, warm market. And, and warm market is a lot of different things. Uh, I teach warm market methods. Uh, in my new agent class a little bit, but but warm market is anything where you can get an introduction to it um, and for sale by owners and expires. Those are the six main sources of business. So we'll give you most of your business. So if you don't have a marketing plan for each one of those, now what will happen is when you're going out and you're starting, you're gonna market to those different sources and then uh, uh, you're gonna find a niche, you know, and uh, and then you just, work the heck out of that niche and you, and you bless a lot of lives and make money. But to get started, guys, that's, that's your best bet. So if Got you don't want to work any of those, uh, go ahead and get your license and uh, don't quit your day job. Got another question from Crystal. She says, oh. thoughts on being involved in a team versus being an individual agent with a brokerage? Being a part of a team is real popular right now. A lot of people are pushing teams and uh, you know you go with a celebrity type agent, does a lot of radio, TV or other types of advertising, or maybe they just have a big team. And um, I, think, I think it depends on the individual. I think if, if you're a go-getter and you've been successful in your past and you're approachable and um, you're willing to work, I don't think you need a team. Because what will happen on a team is you're going to be put doing all the grunt work. You're, you know, they're going to bring you in and have you on the phone for six hours a day. And that's your, that's your day. You know? And that's okay if you need that kind of discipline and experience. Uh, on the other hand, being part of a team can be a really good thing if, because there's an agent that's working hard with you. But what, what they do is they take all the credit and then you get a much smaller commission. Um, you know, they, they're on a high commission split with their broker. They may be on 90% or 85 or a higher percentage. And then they're going to give you 50% of the deal. And they're going to make the spread between your 50 and what they would normally get on the thing. But they're supervising you and they're helping you and they're making you make phone calls. If you're, if you're disciplined enough to do your own marketing uh, and, you know, if you're smart, if you're techno savvy, and someone mentioned social media the other day. That's where a lot of leads are coming in uh, today. And that's how you would contact all these people. But there's way you has, ways you have to contact them as well, guys. Uh, there's a book I would recommend to you. Uh, it, 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 it's cheap, it's a paperback. It's like you know, less than 20 bucks from Amazon. It's called uh, Exactly What to Say for Real Estate Agents exactly what to say for real estate agents. I had one of my babies I was mentoring here. Uh, I had a three month contract to mentor some babies. <laughs> we had a great time, uh, but it was, um, uh, one of them got that book and shared it with me. I thought it was a great book. So I'd recommend it to you. I think it's good. I bought one. Actually, I bought two because I lose things because I'll end them out. But anyway. Rhea says that book is awesome. Yeah. Did I tell you about it, Dan, or did you hear about it somewhere else? Uh, Andrea said she's reading it. <clears throat> oh. oh, are you reading it, Andrea? I am. Um, you mentioned it in one of the classes. Yeah, recently. yeah. I, I went to Audible and got it, and I'm telling you, it was just already it was gold before I've even gotten my license, so. Yeah, because a lot of agents are, you know, they're afraid of what do I say? What if, if they say this, what do, how do I respond? What do I say? And it gives you a track to run on, you know, I mean, I think you can be sincere with people and, and still have a, a path to walk on, <laughs> you know. Yeah, so, and my take, it's, it's giving you like those guiding yeah. principles, you know, like this, this footstep, then this footstep, and it might look like different turf for different people. You're wearing a different shoe, you're a different person, but right. it just, I could see how you could like mold that to who you are and just see that sequence. It was good. You know, it's, it's. You know, I mean, if you take your family out to McDonald's, it's going to cost more than that book. Okay. 
So buy the dang book, okay? You should be reading things all the time and taking classes all the time. Dan, I lost track. Where are we? Well, it's seven o'clock, so we maybe should just wrap it up. Okay. We only had two questions left anyway, guys. So you'll, you can get a, can you get a copy of the question, Stan? Yeah, I can send out a copy. Okay. If you'd like to have them. I, I wrote down your concerns about, you know, like, you know, the, the, the financial aspects of running your own business and, and, uh, you know, how do you get your clients and, and, you know, how do you compete with older agents? You know, I want you guys to know that there's, I had a, I had a crusty old millionaire guy called me on a, on a sign call. I was in the office and the listing agent wasn't in the office and um, he called on a sign call and I, I got the call. And his name was Al Partee. He was a self-made millionaire. Uh, and he wanted to go look at this exquisite house. And I didn't, you know, I mean, this was like my first month or so and the second month into business. And uh, he, um, Al Partee. So, he, you know, I said, well, Mr. Partee, I need to know some particulars about your finances. We just don't want to show these houses to anyone, you know, and, you know, could you tell me a little bit about what your income level is? He said, look, my name's Al Partee, just ask around. I want to go see it tomorrow at this time. Okay, Mr. Partee, you know, I'll come pick you up. So I asked around the office and the office administrators in there said, does anyone ever hear of a guy named Al Partee? And she's like, are you kidding? Al Partee? Good grief. Why did he call you? <laughs> he just called on the side. He says, well, what's, what's he want? He wants to buy this big house we have listed. And he says, oh my gosh, you know, yeah, he's, he can buy anything he wants. Don't worry about it. So I went to pick him up. He was working in the garden in his front yard. His pants were dirty and he had a, they were actually torn. And, he, and I says, well, Mr. Part, you know, I thought it was a gardener. It's Mr. Partee. Oh, I'm Al Partee. I shook his hand and we hopped in my car and we drove over to this house. He didn't even change clothes. <laughs> and we went to this house and uh, uh, it was the longest negotiating I, I ever did. I, we were wrote like 16 offers and counter offers. It was, it was a nightmare, but I finally got it under contract. I'll tell you the story someday. But um, the guy that owned the house was a guy that had done Al dirty when he was on his way up. And that guy was in the middle of a divorce on his way down. <laughs> And when Al saw his house go up for sale, there's only one house in town Al wanted to buy. He wanted to buy that house because it was that guy's house. And he did. He did. And he paid a lot for it. And I made a huge commission and everyone was happy. And Al had, you know, had a new bride and she thought it was great. And uh, six months, eight months later, nine months, 10 months, about a year later, uh, Al's new bride and he were splitting the sheets. <laughs> I got to list it again and resell it again. But I did three other deals with Al, you know, it's quite big deals. And Al, Al told me this. He says, Roller, I knew you were a snot-nosed kid in the business. I was 20-something years old. He says, I knew you were new. But, you know, people helped me on the way up. And it's my turn. So for those of you that are new, some people, like Al Partee, might do business with you just because you're new. And you remind them of them when they were new and someone gave them a hand up. So don't, you know, I mean, if someone asks you how long you've been in the business, I tell them, you know, I say, hey, you know, not very long, but man, I got a lot of people behind me. My broker's got, you know, thousands of transactions and deals and whatever, you know, I mean, but know how to respond, but I wouldn't lie to someone about it. So guys, appreciate you being with you tonight. I, uh, these are really fun for me. I hope they're fun for you. Uh, Dan, you want to put my phone number up for him? Uh, you're welcome to call me. I've had a couple of people call me this week uh, with questions. I, I would prefer that if you're stuck on something, you don't understand it, that you pick up the phone and give me a call. The, uh, it's my personal cell phone, 801-556-8000. 801-556-8000. We'll spend a quality 10 minutes, five minutes, three minutes on the phone. You'll understand the concept. And I'd much rather you did that, particularly if it's the night before the exam or the exam's two days away, because I don't want you spending an hour trying to find that question in a, in a manual or something. <laughs> Just call on the phone. We'll talk about it. We'll get it done. You'll be happy. 
there's only one time that's inappropriate to call and that's when you're in the exam itself. I'd be the most help to you then, but we both get into a lot of trouble. And they take your cell phone away from you anyway, make you lock it up, so it wouldn't work. But uh, thanks for being here, folks. Uh, Dan and I are, we love meeting with you and helping and anything we can do to help, don't hesitate to call the school or call me personally. I answer my own phone. Have a great night. Awesome, thanks, Rick. You're thanks. very welcome. Bye -bye. Thank you, it was awesome. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, everyone.